Welcome back to the Camilla Tomini Show on GB News. I'm joined now by Alexander Larman, the author of a new book, Power and Glory, the latest release in his trilogy series about the royal family. Alexander, lovely to see you this morning. We've got it flashed up there. Wonderful. Lovely book cover featuring uh, the Queen with her father there, George VI. Wonderful. Um, let's talk about whether the monarchy is in crisis, because I know the book covers the abdication crisis and I suppose the aftermath of Princess Diana's death and all of the trials and tribulations that the royals have faced in living memory. But the monarchy today, the king diagnosed with cancer, the princess of Wales diagnosed with cancer, is it a crisis? Well, it's not a crisis in terms of the abdication crisis, which is obviously a constitutional crisis, but it's a personal and family crisis, which is extending out into how the monarchy is being perceived. Because one of the themes in my book is that George VI had cancer, and it was concealed from him and concealed from everybody else. Let me just stop you on that. Concealed from him? Yes. What was he told? Well, he was told that he had this illness, which was advanced bronchitis. And even though he had to have his lung removed, yes. he was still being told there was nothing seriously the matter with him. So and was it true to say that he was operated on within Buckingham Palace because they obviously didn't want news to get out that he was seriously ill? Yes, there was a makeshift operating theatre constructed. And he's very stoic about it. I mean, he said that he didn't mind going under the surgeon's knife and things like that. But it's a remarkable idea, isn't it, that the king could be lied to by the surgeons around him because they were so fearful this news would come out. And you have to look at reputations and look at the way in which having a king with cancer would be seen as somehow shameful. Mm. So it's interesting that now, all these decades on, that we've had such honesty from Buckingham Palace. Um, I mean, uh, initially before the cancer was diagnosed, we obviously had that word, those words, enlarged prostate in a Buckingham Palace missive, which I don't think we'd have seen before. Um, is it a good thing that the palace are being more transparent about these health conditions or is it actually destabilising? I think the palace has to be more honest because, I mean, you can look what happened with Kate where when the whole truth wasn't being revealed, I mean, the speculation mm. got so wild, people were coming forward with the most outrageous ideas and these were being taken seriously in mainstream circles. And I think one thing is, is that we are obsessed by the health of the royal family because as the first family in this country... We looked for them to set an example, and the fact that at the moment two of the senior members have cancer is absolutely unprecedented. And we certainly haven't seen a situation like this in history. Although it's interesting, isn't it, how the palace responds to social media trolling. I mean, I appreciate that obviously the young Princess Elizabeth and indeed Princess Margaret and George VI and the Queen Mother, when they were bringing up those daughters, they weren't having to live in this age of sort of 24-hour news and people publishing whatever they like with impunity on the internet. You then have to ask yourself the extent to which the palace responds to that, because there were some that might have said that the Princess of Wales even entertaining the idea of posing up for Mothering Sunday and releasing an image was just to answer critics that are never, ever going to be satisfied, let's be honest. There's always going to be on trolls on social media for whom there is no response that is the right response. And they have carried on to this day. But I think one thing that's very interesting is if you look at the difference between the responses, Buckingham Palace came forward very quickly and gave a fairly candid idea of what's happening with Charles and what his illness is. Kensington Palace didn't. And I think that's because Prince William is much more into the vein of never complain, never explain, mm. which was his grandmother's motto, his great-grandfather's motto, and has always served the royal family well. Well, but it doesn't hold up in 2024 because no. you've got to allow the idea that information is going to get out into the public, which, whether you like it or not. Yes. Well, sometimes the royals take ownership of their own information, don't they? I mean, <laughs> we think back to the Megxit bombshell, Harry and Meghan announcing that on their own website. How damaging do you think Megxit has been for the royal family? I don't think it's been particularly damaging at all, actually, because I think that Harry and Meghan, initially, there is all the controversy and the difficulty. But ever since Harry published his memoir, Spare, which was a ridiculous book, Book. There's no sense whatsoever that they are a serious couple. I mean, I was looking at the American mm -hmm. Riviera Orchard revelation the other day, and I thought... Yeah, that's Meghan's new lifestyle brand. And I thought, and Wallace Simpson, who is obviously Meghan's spiritual forebear, would have done her own lifestyle brand, but with quite so crass a title, no, I don't think so. Do you think Harry and Meghan are a sort of latter-day Edward and Wallace? I think they definitely are, yes. I and mean, you can see the haplessness that Edward had in Harry. You can also see the steely determination to make money in Meghan. So I think they're very lucky to find each other because they've made two people miserable rather than four. And much the same thing can be said about the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. I mean, I know that your book is looking back at uh, living memory of the royals. What would you say has been, let's look at actually the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, a sort of stalwart on the throne, a, a guiding presence. We think about her we'll meet again speech and other key moments. And obviously her reign was characterised by her never having really put a foot wrong. However, what do you think might have been one of the key mistakes she made and what do you think is probably her greatest triumph of her reign? 
Well, I think her greatest triumph was for sheer longevity. And as you yes. say, she never put a serious foot wrong. There was never any discussion about her abdicating the throne. There was never any discussion about her causing any kind of harm to the institution of the royal family. I think the only misstep she ever made was how she handled Diana's death. Yes. Because I feel that, again, the never complain, never explain adage didn't work back in 1997. And you can see that it probably stopped working around the time she became queen, actually, because we live in an age of mass communication. We live in an age where people want to know the news instantly. And if you are this major institution which is blocking the news and blocking the output of news, you're going to end up in a situation where people are disappointed and then they start to look for something else. And I think that being slow to realise what the changing world is has always been a problem with the royal family. Although she kind of t turned a mistake into one of her greatest triumphs, I thought, because when she did give the televised address, where she spoke not just as your queen but as a grandmother, she really managed to rescue what was looking like an increasingly difficult situation that week, to be fair to the late queen. Oh, absolutely. And she turned it around magnificently. And one thing she was always so good at, and you just referenced to a We'll Meet Again speech, is that she understood the mood of the nation. And I think that was partly because she had an excellent comms team around her, you know, really dedicated private secretaries. But it was also because, as somebody who was a veteran of the institution of monarchy, she'd seen every conceivable challenge that could have been levelled at her, and she mm. overcame all of them. And she was a deeply remarkable woman. Um, and uh, on the King, it's interesting to see reports that he does look as if he wants to go ahead with a two-week visit to Australia this October. That's despite him being nearly 76 by that point and undergoing cancer treatment. Is that a good idea, do you think? I mean, there's this sense, I think, that he needs to shore up the Commonwealth, which wasn't a discussion that necessarily took place on the late Queen's watch. Well, I think it's the thing that kings always want to do, which is to announce this great foreign trip that's going to firm up their reign. I mean, George VI wants to go to Australia as well, and he wasn't able to. And you go back further in history, and Henry IV was obsessed by going to Jerusalem. So I think there's always a sense that a king will say, I want to do this trip. But the Commonwealth is very much up in the air, isn't it? Because Prince William has publicly said that he believes the Commonwealth will probably come to an end during his reign. And obviously, we have no idea when that reign is going to begin, because we can say we think the Commonwealth is going to exist for another 10, 20, 30 years. But is it really? OK, Alexander Larman, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Your book, Power and Glory, I think, is out now, if yes. people would like to read it. Well, thank you very much to Alexander and to all of my guests today.